Good evening. We have quite a full house, so welcome. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Dominican University. My name is Rachel Hartwinner, and I am the director of the St. Catherine of Siena Center. And it is my pleasure to see you all here tonight, and my privilege to introduce Father Gregory Boyle. Father Greg is a Jesuit priest and is the founder and executive director of Homeboy Industries. He has received degrees from Gonzaga University, Loyola Marymount University, Weston School of Theology, and the Jesuit School of Theology. Prior to his work with Homeboy Industries, he taught high school and lived and worked with Christian-based communities in Bolivia. Father Greg then brought his dedication to finding a place for all in society to the Boyle Heights community of East Los Angeles, where he started what would become Homeboy Industries. Now, in its 26th year of operation, Homeboy is the largest gang intervention, rehabilitation, and re-entry program in the United States. Homeboy started as a bakery and has grown to include seven social enterprises which both employ and offer services to those people most in need. It is truly a model for finding imaginative ways to engage young people for whom gangs provide one of the only sources of family and belonging. Father Greg's work at Homeboy Industries is a hope-filled alternative. As you will hear tonight, the stories from the people that called Homeboy Industries home are truly inspiring. Homeboy employs more than 300 former gang members while also providing support for the thousands of individuals that cross its doors every year. Father Greg has received numerous awards for his work. He speaks at schools and universities across the United States. And he's also the best-selling author of the New York Times book, Tattoos on the Heart, the Power of Boundless Compassion. In this powerful book, which I'm sure many of you have read tonight, he shares stories of his experiences in the Boyle Heights community, which is often called the gang capital of the world. Not only is Father Greg a gifted author and a renowned storyteller, he is a man of profound faith who affirms that we are all created in the image of God and worthy of God's boundless love and compassion. He brings life to stories, as we will soon see tonight, stories which are both beautiful and tragic. And he invites his readers and audiences to find the good, to find God, so that we may embody God's compassion in our own attitudes and actions. Many of us here tonight have indeed read his book, or been touched in some way by the work he does. He has been called a national treasure, the Gandhi of the gangs, and a true advocate for peace. So it really is a privilege, and I know we will all be gifted in some way by his presence among us tonight. So please help me warmly welcome to the stage, Father Greg Boyle. Thank you very much. It's a real privilege to be here. I've never been here before, so uh, I like going to places I've never been. Um, I, there were scalpers outside, apparently. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I don't I believe that's ever happened at a talk I've given. <laughs> Though there are empty seats, so uh, in the nosebleed or the cerebral hemorrhage uh, section up there. The, uh, you know, I. Uh, just came off a retreat uh, a couple days with a whole bunch of gang members and they always, oh my gosh, I'm so privileged. They, they teach me everything of value. Uh, there's a homie named Lewis who's uh, kind of runs the place for me and he's, uh, you know, he's become something of a public speaker in his own right. And uh, so a couple nights ago he, was, uh, he went on this retreat to help me run this retreat. And uh, he was giving me tips, you know, like uh, um, elements he thought that went into a good speech. And uh, 
he said, you know, you have to pepper your talk with self-defecating humor. <laughs> I said, yeah, no shit. <laughs> so brace yourselves. Um, how many folks here are from uh, old St. Pat's? Oh my gosh. How many of you are just old? Uh, okay, my people. Uh, so uh, the St. Pat's folks have heard me, I guess that was a few years ago, and I don't know. It, it, that always sort of undoes me a little bit because you know maybe I'll say a thing or two that I've said before. It happens. I, I was at a foster grandparent gathering, huge gathering in Southern California, and I had spoken at it uh, the summer before. I don't know why, but they invited me two summers in a row, and that kind of uh, makes it hard for me a little bit. And, and afterwards, this grandmother came up to me, and I think she liked the talk. She had big tears in her eyes, and she grabbed both my hands, and she said, I heard you last year. <laughs> it never gets better. So, kind of hoping she misspoke there, but uh, <laughs> not entirely certain. Well, thanks for your attention, and this, uh, this crowd is really uh, so very nice, and thank you, Rachel, and everybody who's put this together, and uh, it takes a lot of work to bring people out, so thank you for your attention. You know, folks on the margins are just hoping for a little bit of notice. I had a very earnest 16-year-old gang member stand in front of my desk once, and he said, look, I need your divided attention. <laughs> I said, you are in luck, because uh, that is exactly what you'll be getting today. <laughs> so I, 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 I never think that uh, if, if a crowd like this shows up, I, I, I think it only has to do with the, the hard work of the people here and the people organizing this event, and it is hard work. But there's a kind of a vision that brings you to uh, a gathering on a Tuesday night. Uh, it's a vision of wanting the world to look differently than it currently looks. The prophet Habakkuk writes, the vision still has its time, presses on to fulfillment, and it will not disappoint. And if it delays, wait for it. But none of us want to wait for too long, you know, con los brazos cruzados, you know, tapping our feet, staring at our watches, waiting for something to happen. You want to make something happen. And the thing that I, I, I suggest all the time, uh, that, uh, that God's dream come true for us, the thing that he wants us to make happen, is the creation of a community of kinship such that God, in fact, might recognize it. Mother Teresa diagnosed the world's ills correctly, I think, when she suggested that the problem in the world is that we've just forgotten that we belong to each other. So how do we stand against forgetting that? How do we imagine a circle of compassion and then imagine nobody standing outside that circle? How do we, together in our own particularities, choose to dismantle the barriers that exclude? How do we inch our way out to the margins and, and stand there? The trick about the margins is that if you in fact stand there, look under your feet, they're getting erased because you chose to do exactly that. And you stand with the poor and the powerless and the voiceless. And you stand with those whose dignity has been denied and you stand with those whose burdens are more than they can bear. Every once in a while, and everybody in this room, I suspect, has had this privileged moment when you get to stand with the easily despised and the readily left out, with the demonized so that the demonizing will stop, and with the disposable so that the day will come when we stop throwing people away. 
So I suspect that if kinship were in fact our goal, we would no longer be promoting justice. We would in fact be celebrating it. No kinship, no justice. No kinship, no peace. No matter how singularly focused we may well be on those really truly worthy goals, they in fact can't happen unless there's some undergirding sense that we are connected and, and we belong to each other. Uh, so the homies are endlessly uh, teaching me things that are uh, of so much value. And uh, a lot of our spirituality, I think, at, uh, at Homeboy is really Ignatian spirituality with two very large side orders of uh, L'Arche, you know, Jean Vanier, L'Arche, and, uh, and the worker priests. And so uh, Jean Vanier always talks about, I, I'm a student uh, in, at the University of the Poor. And, I, and I, f I feel endlessly a student at the University of the Homey. So they've taught me things every day. And, uh, but the last couple of years they've taught me how to text, so I'm really grateful to them. <laughs> I was madly texting right now, and uh, just constant, thousands of texts. And I'm pretty good at it, LOL and OMG and <laughs> BTW, and, and the homies have taught me a new one, OHN, which apparently stands for, oh, hell no. <laughs> And I've been using that one quite a bit lately. <laughs> so there I am uh, with two homies, Manuel and Poncho. They're going to help me uh, give a talk at this high school, some distance from homeboys. So we gather at 9 when everybody, when the day begins after our morning meeting. And so we're in the car. We're driving. Manuel's in the front seat. He's got shotgun. And so um, if he were 15 minutes uh, on the road and... Uh, Manuel gets an incoming. So he reads his text and he sort of chuckles to himself. And I said, what is it? He goes, oh, it's dumb. It's from Snoopy back at the office. Well, I'd just seen Snoopy. Snoopy gave me a big abrazote as the day was beginning. And Snoopy and Manuel work together in the clock-in room where they clock in uh, hundreds and hundreds of our workers. And it's actually quite a hard, difficult job. And I said, well, what's he say? He goes, oh, it's dumb. Hang on. Uh, hey, dog, it's me, Snoops. Yeah, they got my ass locked up at county jail. They're charging me with being the ugliest vato in America. <laughs> you have to come down right now, show them they got the wrong guy. <laughs> well, the three of us, we just, just dissolved in laughter. And, uh, and then I realized that Manuel and Snoopy are enemies. They're from rival gangs. They used to shoot bullets at each other. Now they shoot text messages. And there's a word for that, and the word is kinship. How do we bridge the distance that still remains between us? How do we obliterate once and for all the illusion that we are separate? You know, even in service, uh, we were talking earlier with the old St. Pat's folks that, uh, you know, we, we need to let go of service. We'll s certainly let go of service as the end all. Uh, it's where you begin, but it can't be where you end. And the, and the impetus and the, and the longing and the desire to be of service is obviously a good thing. But there can be in service a distance, and you want to always be attentive to that. You always want to... Uh, make sure there is no daylight that separates us. You know, service provider, service recipient. At Homeboy Industries, I'm not the great healer, and uh, that gang member over there is in need of my exquisite healing. The truth be told, we're all a cry for help. We're all in need of healing. And service then is, a, is the hallway. Go ahead and walk down the hallway, but you're trying to get to the ballroom, which is the place of exquisite mutuality, the place of kinship and ultimate connection, the place of relationship. Jesus invited folks 
to enter into this friendship, into this relationship. And, and once that was done, the next invitation was to community. And that's the way it's supposed to work. That's the praise God, the only praise God has any interest in is that we engage in that. One of the great privileges of my life was knowing Cesar Chavez as a friend, and uh, was, he was an extraordinary listener. If, if you were talking to Cesar, nobody else existed. He didn't look over your shoulder for somebody more important on the approach. But once a reporter had commented to him and said, uh, wow, these farm workers, they sure love you. And Cesar just shrugged and smiled and said, the feeling's mutual which of course is the goal. I had a PBS uh, reporter once end his interview by saying, how's it feel to have saved thousands and thousands of lives? And I said, I don't mean to be coy or cute, I, but I honest to God don't know what you're talking about. I think saving lives is for the Coast Guard. <laughs> I, I kind of don't believe in it. The only life I save is my own by showing up every day. The homies rescue me uh, when I lack uh, courage. The homies swoop down and douse me with a big old bucket of uh, humility when I'm utterly convinced of the rightness of my position. The homies teach me in the university of the homie what it means to be noble and what it means to be kind and the power of tenderness. And my life is saved every day, even when I'm not there, thanks to the magic of texting. <laughs> but you want to bridge the distance even in service because uh, you don't want any daylight to separate us, which is God's dream come true. That's the whole point. Uh, so uh, I, there was a homie named uh, Dreamer. Everybody called him Dreamer, and, and nobody found more job opportunities through Homeboy Industries than this guy. I knew him since he was a mocosito growing up in the housing projects when I was pastor, and uh, he got into trouble, got into a gang, and then a very smart kid but didn't really stay in school too much, but brilliant, really, uh, with a devious, dangerous sense of humor. And, uh, but I'd find him jobs, and he'd always gravitate back to vague criminality, usually things involving drugs, the sale of or the use of. And then he'd always wander back uh, to homeboy. And so this one time he finished a four-month stretch uh, a probation violation in county jail, and so there he is sitting in front of me, and he says what homies often say, this time it'll be different. I go, hmm, all right. So with him sitting there, I call a friend of mine named Gary, who runs a vending machine company in Alhambra, California. He had hired homies in the past. I'm thinking maybe he'll do it again. And sure enough, he says, yeah, tell him he can start tomorrow. That's a holy man right there. So uh, Dreamer began work at the vending machine company, and about two weeks later, there he is sitting in front of my desk, and I go, híjole, madre santa, here we go. <laughs> I can't even believe this. And, and before I can say anything, he pulls out of his pocket his very first paycheck, and he's so proud, you know. And he says, damn, gee, this paycheck makes me feel proper. I mean, my jefita, she's proud of me, and my morritos, they're not ashamed of me. And you know who I have to thank for this job. And I said, well, gosh. <laughs> who? <laughs> and he looked at me strangely, and he said, well, God, of course. <laughs> oh! <laughs> no, that, that's right, that, that, that would be God. Yeah. He said, you thought I was going to say you. I said, no, gosh. God's number one. He said, you are so lucky we're not living in them Genesis days. 
and I'm sorry, them Genesis days? He goes, yeah, because God would have been had struck down your ass already by now. <laughs> and we just, we just fell out of our chairs howling with laughter. And I defy you to identify exactly who is the service provider and who is the service recipient. I have no idea. It's mutual. So Homeboy was born, uh, and if you've read the book and if you've heard me talk, I'm sorry, to, I have to do the boilerplate seven minutes on, on uh, Homeboy, so bear with me. But it was born during the time I was pastor of the poorest parish in the city of Los Angeles, Dolores Mission. And it was nestled, this little tiny church, uh, in the middle of two public housing projects, Pico Gardens and Aliso Village. At the time, it was the largest grouping of public housing west of the Mississippi. And so we had eight gangs at war with each other, which is unheard of, because normally in a, a public housing project, you would have one gang that dominated, or the only gang there, really. But we had eight, which was really difficult. Uh, there was a time when I had, oh gosh, eight funerals in a three-week period. So I buried my first young person, killed because of this sadness, in 1988 and I buried my 194th about uh, three months ago. Not all from that community, but I, because I run a large gang intervention program, I get asked to do this a lot. So, you know, the main thing with ministry, it seems to me, is that you want to receive, you want to listen. And there are two tracks, I think, in ministry in the end, one is, the one that's driven by hubris that says, here's what your problem is and here's what you need to fix. And the other one is, uh, hopes to model Jesus's way of wanting to enter into relationship and to receive, you know, what would help you? So in those days, we had lots of uh, junior high, middle school age gang members who had been given the boot from their homeschool. Nobody wanted them. And so, um, so they were wreaking havoc in the projects. They were writing on the walls and selling drugs and they were violent. So I remember walking out to them and I would talk to them individually and in the course of trying to be in relationship, you know, I'd say, you know, if I found a school that would take you, would you go? And then to my surprise, uh, they all said, yeah, every single one. And then I couldn't find a school that would take them. So uh, <laughs> that kind of forced my hand. So uh, in those days, we had our parochial school. Our elementary school was the first two floors of this building. But the entire third floor was the convent. And um, so I gathered all the nuns in the living room. And I said, hey, you know, would you guys mind, you know, moving out? And uh, <laughs> and we'll turn the convent into a school for gang members. And, and they said, sure. <laughs> it was really that simple. Yay, nuns, where would we be without them? <laughs> the, the church I belong to is nuns on a bus. Okay, end of uh, editorial comment. So, um, and so that, this uh, whole thing uh, uh, brought gang members to the church. You know, people sometimes hear that and they think, oh, they started to go to mass. You know, well, no. It brought them to the church property, and which the, the school was across the street from the church. So, so this, uh, all these gang members sort of coming to the church property was... Uh, really you know, created something of a disconnect for our people in those days, you know, because it was hard, because aren't churches supposed to be hermetically sealed? You know, good people in and bad people out. And so, so that was a good, healthy gospel challenge, I think. And so, uh, and then they just, again, you're listening, you know, and, and they, they'd say, well, you know, if only we had jobs. So myself and the women, we marched around the housing, uh, development where all these factories kind of circled the whole place, the projects, you know, in search of felony friendly employers, you know, and, <laughs> and that wasn't so forthcoming. So, 
So uh, we started to invent things. We invented uh, graffiti removal crews and light landscaping and maintenance crews. And we, we had a crew of enemy rival gang members who built a child care center. So we did all these things. Um, uh, Mike Wallace from 60 Minutes came and that kind of, uh, the money that poured in from that show uh, you know, sustained us for an entire year. So we kind of had more crews and more homies. But it still wasn't enough because the demand was so great. So I, I, I met a movie producer. I said, hey, buy this old abandoned uh, bakery across the street from the church and we'll put hair nets on rival gang members and, <laughs> and they'll bake bread. We'll call it Homeboy Bakery. And he said, sure. So. So we were off and running, and uh, then um, two months later, we started Homeboy Tortillas in the Grand Central Market. Once we had plural, we came up with the highfalutin uh, Homeboy Industries, as if there was any industry involved in this. <laughs> uh, anything worth doing is worth failing at. That, that'll be on my tombstone, uh, among other things. Uh, and uh, not everything worked. You know, Homeboy Plumbing really was not hugely successful. <laughs> Who knew? I, I, uh, people didn't want gang members in their homes. I, I, I did not see that coming. And then nobody ever intends to do anything like this, but you back your way, you evolve eventually, and, and you turn around and you go, wow, uh, we're the largest gang intervention rehab and reentry program in the United States. Nobody intended to ever do that, certainly not me. But those things happen sometimes. And so 15,000 folks walk through our doors every year. There are 1,100 gangs in LA County, 120,000 gang members. And so though our program is not for those who need help, it's only for those who want it. So you have to walk through the doors. And just about anything that you could imagine that might be helpful, we do. A lot of curricular things from anger management and grief and loss and parenting. We still have a school with 120 students in it, all gang members, all on probation. Uh, they all work for us part-time while they go to school to incentivize their education. Free tattoo removal, no place on the planet, removes more gang tattoos than we do. Uh, three uh, laser machines, uh, 47 volunteer doctors, uh, something like 40,000 treatments a year. Um, so if any of you are starting to regret that Dominican tattoo you have, uh, <laughs> see, see me afterwards. And it was all started, uh, if you've read the book, you know, by a guy named Frank, who I'd never met and wandered into my office uh, two days after being released from Corcoran State Prison. I'd never met him before, and there he's sitting in front of my desk. And, Tattooed on his forehead, filling the entire space like a damn billboard, said, fuck the world. <laughs> and he looked at me and he said, you know, I am having a hard time finding a job. <laughs> I said, well, well, Frank, uh, maybe we could put our heads together on this one. You know? <laughs> So I think, you know, where am I going to send them? You know, to McDonald's? You know, uh, do you want fries with that? No, I don't want fries. <laughs> Mothers clutching their kids, running out of the store. So I hired him, and he bagged bread for two years, and I found a doc at White Memorial Hospital who, who uh, donated his time and his laser machine for one hour a month to chip away at Frank's forehead and a few others. And pretty soon I had a waiting list of 3,000 gang members wanting the same uh, service. So we couldn't really stay with that uh, mode. And uh, Frank is a security guard at a movie studio in Hollywood, and there is no trace left of the dumbest thing he had ever done. <laughs> Proving once and for all, as Sister Helen Prejean says, all of us are a whole lot more than the worst things or dumbest things we've ever done. And so we have mental health therapy. Everybody's in therapy. We have five paid therapists, but 40-some a volunteer therapist. Uh, we have case management. Uh, everybody has uh, case managers, have about 30 on each caseload. We have all our training programs. Uh, 
uh, solar panel installation training program. We have our 10 businesses, uh, Homeboy uh, Silk Screen, which is uh, thriving, been around for about 20 years. Homeboy Bakery is doing very well. Homeboy Diner, the only place you can uh, buy food at City Hall. Um, Homeboy uh, Bakery and Cafe, which is a, a, a restaurant we have at the American Airlines Terminal. I saw it this morning with the line snaking down the hall. Uh, Terminal 4, if you ever travel to LA. Um, we have the farmer's markets in a 40-some uh, farmer's markets where we sell our stuff. We have what we call Homeboy Grocery, which is we sell chips and salsas and other prepared like salads and stuff with kind of a jalapeno twist um, in all the supermarkets in uh, uh, Ralph's in Southern California. Homeboy Homegirl merchandise. We have a new a thing called uh, Homeboy Environmental Services, which is we send 30 gang members to clean the storm drains in the city. It's a, it's a big deal and a big contract. Um, and they love it. And then uh, Homeboy Lunch Truck, which was launched about a month ago. And lunch trucks seem to be the big deal now. And Homegirl Cafe, where women with records, young ladies from rival gangs, waitresses with attitude, will gladly, <laughs> gladly take your order. <laughs> uh, if you go there, and I hope you will, uh, you know, it's kind of a who's who. You're always running into, especially in LA circles, uh, electeds are always there. And movie stars, Jim Carrey created pandemonium one day there. Um, the entire Dodger team came once for lunch, and that was a manicomio. Um, and uh, famously, uh, Diane Keaton, uh, she even tells this story on herself when she wrote this book. Somebody told me that she told it. Uh, she was, uh, came for lunch, and she was there with a regular, a guy who's there once a week, and her waitress this day is Glenda, and Glenda's a homegirl, been there, done that, tattooed, felon, been to prison gang member, she doesn't know who Diane Keaton is, and so she's taking her order, and Diane Keaton says, well, what do you recommend? And Glenda rattles off the three platillos that she particularly likes, and then uh, Diane Keaton says, oh, I'll have that second one, that one sounds good, and, and then for some reason at that moment, something dawns on Glenda, and she looks at Diane Keaton, and she says, wait a minute, I feel like I know you from somewhere, you know, like maybe we've met. And Diane Keaton decides to sort of deflect it humbly. Oh, gosh, I don't know. I suppose I have one of those faces, you know, that <laughs> people think they've seen before. And then, then Glenda goes, no, now I know. We were locked up together. <laughs> yeah, that just took my breath away when I heard it. And, uh, and I don't believe we've had any further Diane Keaton sightings now that I think of it. <laughs> but suddenly kinship so quickly, Oscar winning actress, attitudinal waitress, exactly what God had in mind. And, and we don't really need to go too far to figure out what's on God's mind. I mean, Jesus tells us pretty clearly that you may be one. I suppose he could have been more self-referential, but it really is about us. We settle so much, we settle for a partial God. When we're being offered this God who loves us without measure and without regret, a God too busy loving us to ever be disappointed. We settle for saying Jesus, when Jesus hopes we'll see Jesus, Jesus hopes we'll be Jesus, that you may be one, that's the only praise God has any interest in, is that we foster that. All of us are called to be what Alice Miller, the late great child psychologist called enlightened witnesses, people who through your kindness and tenderness and focused attentive love, return people to themselves. I don't think you hold the bar up and ask people to measure up. You just show up and you hold the mirror up and you tell people the truth, knowing that your truth is my truth and my truth is a gang member's truth and it all happens to be the same truth. And here's the truth. 
you are exactly what God had in mind when God made you. And then you watch folks on the margins in particular as they become that truth, as they inhabit that truth. And no bullet can pierce it. No four prison walls can keep it out. And death can't touch it because it's huge. But part of our task often enough is to reach in and dismantle the messages of shame and disgrace that keep folks from seeing their truth. Marcus Borg, the great scripture scholar, says that the principal suffering of the poor throughout history and certainly throughout scripture is shame and disgrace. And I think that's quite right. Take a leisurely stroll through the Acts of the Apostles and you'll discover not just a quaint snapshot of life in the earliest Christian community, but what you will find, I think, is, is the measure of health in any community at all, including here at Dominican. Things will leap off the page, and, and they're good metrics. Things like, see how they love one another. I don't think it gets better. There's nobody needy in this community. Excellent. But my favorite one of all was the one that just sort of came out of nowhere and blindsided me. And awe came upon everyone. It would seem that the measure of health in any community at all may well reside in our ability to stand in awe at what the poor have to carry, rather than stand in judgment at how they carry it. Some years ago, I was invited to uh, uh, give uh, speak at a, uh, a conference, an all-day co conference uh, for social workers in Richmond, Virginia. Well, I didn't read the thing very carefully, you know, and I thought it was just, oh, I have a keynote. I open it or I close it. And then I, I read it carefully, and I said, oh, no, uh, it's from 9 to 5. It's a gang in service. I'm the only speaker. <laughs> so I, I, I get two homies, uh, Jose, a Latino gang member, uh, about 25 years old, and uh, Andre, African-American gang member who at the time worked in our merchandise store. I said, look, we're going to Richmond, Virginia. I want you to get up and tell your stories. Take your time, because it... <laughs> because we got a long ass day to fill. <laughs> so uh, I never heard their stories and, and Jose got up and, and 25 years old and uh, he began like, we have an 18 month program and so the first three months is you begin in the humble place which is the um, janitorial, wash windows, clean urinals, that kind of thing. And then you move to another part, a clerical thing, and then you move into one of the businesses. But he kind of didn't do that because he was a man so solid in his recovery that he became uh, very much a, a valued member of our substance abuse team. A man in recovery and dedicated to it himself. A gang member, been to prison, a parolee, tattooed and everything. But uh, he also spent a long stretch of time as a homeless man and uh, an even longer stretch as a heroin addict. So he gets up and, and he sort of begins in an offhanded way. Yeah, I guess you could say my mom and me, we didn't get along so good. I think I was six when she looked at me and she said, why don't you just kill yourself? You're such a burden to me. Well, 600 social workers did just what you did. And then he said, it sounds way worser in Spanish. <laughs> and then 600 social workers did what you just did. He said, I guess I was nine when my mom drove me down to the deepest part of Baja California and she walks me up to an orphanage and she knocks on the door. The guy comes to the door and she says, I found this kid. And she left me there for 90 days until my grandmother could get out of her where she had dumped me. And my grandmother came and rescued me. My mom beat me every single day of my elementary school years with things you could imagine and a lot of things you couldn't. 
Every day, my back was bloodied and scarred. In fact, I had to wear three t-shirts to school every day. First t-shirt, the blood would seep through. Second t-shirt, you could still see it. Finally, the third t-shirt, you couldn't see any blood. Kids at school, they'd make fun of me. Hey, fool, it's 100 degrees. Why are you wearing three t-shirts? And then he stopped speaking, so overwhelmed with emotion. And he seemed to be staring at a piece of his story that only he could see. And when he could speak, he, he did so through his tears. I wore three t-shirts well into my adult years because I was ashamed of my wounds. I didn't want anybody to see them. And now I welcome my wounds. I run my fingers over my scars. My wounds are my friends. After all, how can I help heal the wounded if I don't recognize and welcome my own wounds? And awe came upon everyone. The measure of our compassion lies not in our service of those on the margins, but in our willingness to see ourselves in kinship with them. You stand at the margins and what gets revealed to you as you stand with the broken is not your superiority, but your brokenness. Everything depends on our analysis or on our diagnosis. Nobody in this room has ever met a treatment plan worth a damn that was born of a bad diagnosis. I, I, I suspect that's never happened in the history of medicine. Nobody in this room has ever met a hopeful kid who joined a gang. That's never happened either. But getting it right is really important. Naming it correctly really matters. As if you read the book, you know that I've struggled a, a little bit with, with leukemia and uh, for some years and doing okay at the moment, you know, or as the homies still say, I hear your cancer's in intermission. <laughs> yep, it, apparently it stepped out to the lobby to buy popcorn. <laughs> but this past uh, Christmas, Thanksgiving, before Thanksgiving, I, I had kind of this thing I had to go in for like a couple couple months of treatment, you know, and so word travels fast in the homey world, so I get a, a call from jail, collect, uh, from this guy, Jason, I've known him since he was a little kid, he goes, gee, you got to be honest with me, and I go, I will, are you dying? I go, no, I'm not dying, well, I thought so, that's what I told this guy in here, I told him, I said, hey, G has cancer, but he's getting that shit fixed. <laughs> I said, slow down with the medical jargon, because uh, <laughs> kind of hard to keep up with you. So, but I had gone to a doctor who I no longer go to. Well, I, I, I gave blood. I tried to give blood, and the guy said, ooh, we can't take your blood. So I went, yikes. So I went to this doctor, and he said I had mono, so he treated me for mononucleosis. I think we can agree, you know, that probably there's a difference between mono and leukemia, and... <laughs> So, so, but my point is that a, a bad diagnosis is never neutral. It's always, you waste time and money, it puts you behind the eight ball. I had to be rushed into chemo only because we got it wrong. And we don't want to get it wrong. You know, how we name stuff is really matters. You know, so there I am on the Dr. Phil show. I know, what was I thinking? But, uh, 
And so we thought we had talked the producers down from doing something dumb. So I'm backstage and I hear Dr. Phil say, and now, ladies and gentlemen, the founder and executive director of Homeboy Industries, Father Greg Boyle. So I walk out there and it's kind of like bleachers and people are clapping. I go and there's, uh, to my horror, there's Phil sitting in a stool in the middle of the stage. There, my empty stool is next to him. I'm gonna be on the show for an hour. But on his side of the stage is a beautiful, gorgeous mahogany coffin on four, those little four-wheel gurney dolly deals. On my side of the stage is a perfectly reconstructed jail cell with bars and bed and toilet and sink. They went to great expense for these two set pieces. Well, you already know where this is going. And so uh, they've flown out three young men, uh, 14, 15, 16, African-American, a Latino, a Caucasian kid, flown them from different parts of the country with their very distraught single mothers. And each kid apparently has uh, inched his way uh, closer and closer to uh, perilous gang activity. And so with one at a time, he brings them out. And Phil sort of grabs them by the lapel figuratively. And he says, don't you see where this choice is leading you? To death or to prison. And so by the third kid, I couldn't take it anymore. I said, Phil, how do I break this to you? These kids don't need more data. They are not lacking information. They know it'll lead to death or to prison. They don't care that it will. That's the key diagnostic moment. This is about a lethal absence of hope. No kid is seeking anything when he joins a gang. He's fleeing something, always, no exceptions. Because gangs are the places kids go when they've encountered their life as a misery. And who doesn't know by now that misery loves company? How do we infuse hope to kids for whom hope is foreign? How do we help kids who are traumatized and damaged more than you could ever imagine find their way clear to transform their pain so they don't have to transmit it anymore? And finally, how do we deliver mental health services in a timely and culturally appropriate way. Getting it right and naming it correctly matters. Uh, parentheses, I, I, I'm in 25 different detention facilities where I say mass on a rotating basis and probation camps, are, we have lots of those uh, in LA County and juvenile halls and stuff. Nobody incarcerates more than the United States of America, but nobody incarcerates more young people, trust me, than the state of California. So I, I'm there, I say mass in all these places, and you'll go into a gym or whatever, and I was uh, at this one place, uh, and there was about 100 gang members there. So after mass, they all come up, and I'm in my vestments, and I'm doing the dishes, and we're talking, you know, and, um, and they, you know, I hand out thousands of my card, and a kid came up to me and he said, hey, how do I get your credit card? <laughs> Jack my wallet, I guess. I, oh, well, this is what you mean, sure, no problem. So, uh, so we're standing there talking, you know, and, and I'm doing the dishes, and, and a, uh, a kid over here says, hey, I saw you on Oprah. Well, no, actually it was Dr. Phil. Oh, I said, yeah, I have a hard time telling those two apart myself. <laughs> and a homie over here said, you were on Dr. Phil? Fighting with your wife? <laughs> and these guys are dying laughing over here. And I, uh, I said, well, yeah, but you know, he really gave us some good advice and we're <laughs> doing much better. I'll, I'll I'll tell her you were asking for her. <laughs> anyway, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna uh, just tell one last story, and then I'm gonna, and we're just gonna do it real simple like this. You know, you raise your hand, I'm gonna call on you in like this. So get your question or comment or something. We're not gonna do the microphone. You don't have to come up here in front of everybody. It's gonna be like this, boom, boom, boom. I'll anticipate a question. So people always ask about enemies working together, and it's dicey at first, you know. Uh, a homie will come in and say, I'm ready, ready, ready. And I'll say, okay, um, I have an opening in the bakery, uh, but you have to work with X, Y, and Z, rattling off the names of rivals, enemies. 
And they always do the same thing. They think for a long time and then they say, okay, uh, I'll work with them, I'm not gonna talk to them. <laughs> and I remember how much that bothered me in the early days until, until you discover, of course, that it's impossible for human beings to demonize people they know, you just can't pull it off. You can't sustain it. So I had a homie, a little chaparrito, everybody called him youngster, he was about 19 years old, and I thought he was ready. I, sometimes I call gang members by their gang names, only if they're benign, you know, lefty, shorty, youngster. I won't call anybody sniper or psycho or, you know. I had a guy, big, huge guy, right out of prison, and, and we were walking, we finished talking, and I'm walking him to my door, and I said, by the way, what do your homies call you? Fluffy. Uh, so I have Youngster there, at the, and I bring him to the Homeboy Silkscreen, which has been around for, for 20 years, and, uh, you know, and about 2,500 customers, high quality work, reasonably priced. We UPS to the greater Chicago area. <laughs> so I, uh, I'm introducing him to his 30 coworkers, and I watch this little tiny guy as he shakes hands with each person. There were a lot of rivals, a lot of enemies in those days shakes some firm handshake, looks them in the eyes. I think, wow, this is great. Until he gets to this last kid named Puppet. And Puppet, you know, seems to be wanting to avoid this encounter altogether. And so uh, when Puppet and Youngster are in each other's vicinity, they mumble something, they stare at their shoes, but they don't shake hands. Well, I know they're enemies, because I know what gangs they're from, but he just finished shaking hands with a whole bunch of enemies. I discover later that this is a hatred that's really quite deep and very personal, uh, beyond which uh, they apparently think they can't get past. So I sensed that much at the moment. I said, look, if you guys can't hang working together, let me know. I got a gang of people who want this job. Calladitos, they don't say a word. Well, six months later, Puppet leaves his home to go to a corner store some distance from his house. And uh, he goes in and buys something. And on the way home, for some reason, he decides to take a shortcut. So he dodges into an alley. And because he's taken this detour, suddenly, unexpectedly, he's surrounded by 10 members of a rival gang, 10 against one, and they beat him badly. And while he's lying on the ground, they will not stop kicking his head until he's lifeless. Somebody finds his body and puts him in a car and drives him to White Memorial Hospital where he's declared effectively brain dead. But it's the policy there to keep you connected to machines for 48 hours for two full days so you can see if there's a two full days of a flat read, you know, with no brain activity at all, and then if that's the case, then the doctors can sign the death certificate, make it official. This allowed family and friends to gather. I was uh, giving a talk at St. Louis University. I flew home immediately. I've seen a lot of horrible things in my life, uh, but nothing to compare to the sight of this young man with his head swollen many times its size. It was just, honest to God, so horrifying. You could barely train your eyes at, on him. So at the end of the 48 hour period, I said a blessing prayer over him. I anointed his forehead with oil. We disconnected and a week later we buried him. But in the first 24 hours, while Puppet was lying beaten in the hospital, I was alone in my office and it was 8.30 at night and the phone rang and it was Youngster, Puppet's coworker from the silkscreen factory. Hey, he says, that's messed up about what happened to Puppet. I said, yeah, it is. And then with a certain kind of eagerness even, he says, is there anything I can do? Can I give him my blood? And we both fall silent under the weight of it until finally he breaks the silence 
choking back his tears. And he says with great deliberation, he was not my enemy. He was my friend. We worked together. Now, can I say that always happens at Homeboy Industries? Of course it does. Any exceptions? I can't think of a single one. And it shouldn't surprise us that God's dream come true, that we be one, just happens to be our own deepest longing for ourselves. For it turns out, it's mutual. And so we stand at the margins and we look under our feet and we hope for the erasure of the margins because we've chosen to stand there. And we're confident because Jesus did it way before us. Invites us into relationship and friendship with each other and then invites us into community. The obliteration of the illusion that we are separate. For the vision still has its time, presses on to fulfillment, and it will not disappoint. And if it delays, we wait for it. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, you're, thank you. Let's, um, you're eating into my time. So, yeah, in, uh, ask me a question, it'll trigger a, a story that you haven't read yet. I'm writing a second book. It's a tough slog. Anybody? Yes, sir. Is there anything like homeboy for young women, girls? Well, yeah, homeboy. <laughs> no, no, yeah, we have homegirl cafe. It, the odd thing is that uh, females represent about three to 5% of the 120,000 gang members. So there aren't that many girls in gangs anywhere. And then also women represent a, certainly a smaller proportion of those who are incarcerated. So in order to work at Homeboy, you have to be a gang member or you have to have, uh, you know, you have to be a felon or have been incarcerated. That's where we get most of the women, are, are women who are felons. Because it's hard to, you couldn't fill, frankly, Homegirl Cafe with, with uh, gang members who are female, just because they're, it's, a, it's, a, it's more rarefied than you think. So the gang thing is mainly a guy thing. But having said that, probably 40% of folks who come seeking our services are female. Yes. You just go like this and I'll go like that. Yes? Have you been asked to uh, have your homeboy industry go application in other cities? I mean, I know Chicago would be a somewhat big problem. Um, yeah, so, so what we, we have a thing called the, um, that we've started, called the Homeboy, Global Homeboy Network. And so there are 42 programs uh, in the country and then eight outside the country. And so the idea is um, we don't want to become the McDonald's of gang intervention programs, you know, with over five billion gang members served, you know, so. <laughs> but we want to foster and help folks who are, want to do stuff. Um, 
like the new life centers here in uh, Chicago, of the great and wonderful Matt DeMatteo. And, um, you know, and there's uh, Youth Empowerment in Miami. There's uh, Brotherhood Brew, which is a coffee roasting African-American gang member social enterprise born from Homeboy Industries. So um, Jobs Not Jails, organic gardening a service in Spokane. So there are 42 programs in the country that where they've come to us and we've gone to them. The City Cafe in Wichita. Um, there's uh, Braveheart Industries in Glasgow, Scotland. Um, I went there to give a talk and, uh, and then during the question and answer, yes, I had no idea what, the, what they were asking me. It was, <laughs> I, go, I, I have no idea what you just said to me now. I could pretend, you know. So, but they're wonderful. We love our connection with the, the Scott, uh, the, the folks in Glasgow, Guatemala, Costa Rica, Canada. So rather than airlift Homeboy into another place, we, we would much rather have a network, a movement where people, where we can kind of talk about what we think works and what we think doesn't work, what is helpful and what we think isn't. And then we want people to steal anything, you know, like, and then they glean what is helpful and what isn't, so, or w won't translate. Like, so there is no need whatsoever in Glasgow in the population they're working with for tattoo removal, it doesn't make any sense. But go to Guatemala City, heck yeah. So those, so they take what works, what would make sense there and what doesn't. My gosh, I've never had this happen. Yes. Hi. Yeah, well, uh, you know, we have like 200 volunteers and we have interns and we have people come and spend a certain amount of time. Uh, we're, we're getting some intern from Harvard who's going to hang out for a year. Certainly we have Jesuit volunteers. So it's, it's, it's a place that's conducive to coming and learning. You know, I, I mentioned earlier about Jean Vanier, you know, and, uh, and he has folks who live in their communities, at the large communities, and they're called assistants, you know. And I just like the model of it, you know, because every once in a while, uh, you know, people will come and they'll say, what am I going to do here, like a volunteer? Or high school students who come and do their service projects. What am I going to do here? I go, no, 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 no. What's going to happen to you here? Which is, that's kind of where it has to begin. Uh, it has to begin in relationship and in friendship. I always say that love is the answer, community is the context, and tenderness is the methodology. The only reason any of it works at Homeboy is because of tenderness. You know, we have a school, 120 kids. They're not difficult kids to, to educate. They're impossible kids to educate. <laughs> and they've had no success whatsoever in their educational pursuit. But they show up every day when we graduated 35 in June. Why? Well, because those teachers love them. And it's the tenderness of their presence with them that is ultimately triumphant and transformational. It's not, well, we've switched textbooks, you know, or we've landed on this kind of style of teaching. No, it's the tenderness. But that's what, how it works at Homeboy. Every gang member comes to us with a disorganized attachment. Mom was either frightened or frightening. And you can't calm yourself down if you've never been soothed. And so in community, through tenderness, resilience is discovered. And homies come to terms with what's been done to them and with the stuff they've done. And then 
they have to re-identify who they are in the world, and that's really a large task that can only happen within the tenderness of community. They have to say, oh, I used to think courage was packing a gun. Now I see that has nothing to do with courage. And then they leave us after 18 months. But they're always part of this family, just as you are part of yours. And now, this time, the world will throw at them what it will, but this time they won't be toppled by it. And that's the power of a community of kinship. So we want to model what we think God's dream is for, for the world. So get my card afterwards. Yes, ma'am. Well, I, I was saying earlier, the question is how can you bring the message of boundless compassion? And I, I, I think we just need to put first things recognizably first, you know, and live as though the truth were true and, and not settle. We're endlessly settling. We're always creating God in our own image and it's frustrating. You know, Anne Lamott says that you've know, you know that you've created God in your own image when suddenly God hates the same people you do, you know? <laughs> but, you know, as people of faith, I think we need, we're, we endlessly settle. We, we settle for purity or piety when we're invited to holiness. You know, who doesn't, uh, I mean, I, I, I'm so heartened by our Pope, and not because he's a Jesuit, you know, <laughs> though that helps. <laughs> I, I was in D.C. and I, uh, I was in a cab and I was going from Georgetown to the airport and I get a text, you know, and, and a homie says, what does Habemos Papa mean? And I, and I said, are you seeing white smoke? And uh, and he show, sends me a picture of the smokestack, you know. So I get to the airport and I see, oh my God, he, he's a Jesuit. And uh, he's chosen Francis, you know. Uh, one of my brother Jesuits, we have, there are three of us who work at Homeboy. And Mark Torres is uh, kind of uh, head of our spiritual department and does retreats and stuff like that. And so he was standing there and, and they had CNN on. And, uh, and they're all packed, hundreds and hundreds of gang members watching as Francis comes out on the, the balcony. And wow, one says to the other one, the first Latino pope. <laughs> and the other one says, and the first Jehovah's Witness. <laughs> and, and Mark sort of leans in and says, Jesuit. Uh, never mind. <laughs> but, you know, it, he, he, he writes this encyclical called The Joy of the Gospel. That's, that's where the joy is. And we're, we've spent so much time settling for fear and terror in the church and defense. And, you know, I, I, I don't know. I, I think a lot about this stuff lately because I was... Uh, I was, you know, on a, a, the Christian Broadcasting Network being interviewed by a nicely coiffed Christian lady. And so she said, what, what do you do at Homeboy? And so I went and gave the long list of things that I told you already about, from tattoo removal, from training to mental health therapy, and the list is long. And when I finished, she made a face like she smelled something foul. And she said, yeah, but how much time do you spend each day, you know, praising God. <laughs> I looked at her and I said, all damn day. <laughs> and, but it's a thing I think about a lot, you know, because I was in Australia recently and, and a guy kind of vexed, I think, a little bit with my talk. 
And he said, I guess I'm not really clear, because he also worked with a similar kind of population, at least margin, marginalized youth in, in Brisbane. And he said, I'm not really clear. When do you introduce Christ to the gang member? And I said, never and immediately. And I think that's the truth. That Jesus rolls his eyes, I think, at, at saying Jesus when, when we could be seeing Jesus. And we could, be, we could be Jesus. And the Christ in me recognizes the Christ in you. A woman once after a huge, uh, I was at a, invited to a mega Christian church, I don't know why, somewhere in Southern California, you know, like thousands of people. And afterwards, she didn't really like what I had to say. Oh, your stories are all well and good. There's only one question. Do you bring gang members to Christ? And I said, no. They bring me to Christ. I don't know how else to say it. I think part of the thing is, and it's a particular frustration for me, and I'll end with this. Uh, and I've mentioned it a couple times about what praise does God have any interest in. So, you know, so it occurs to people to invite me to uh, schools, you know, will invite me, you know, they'll force their students to read my book, you know, and, <laughs> and, and I'm not complaining, but I, <laughs> so um, I went to Gonzaga, uh, I was invited to Gonzaga University in Spokane, which is my alma mater, and, um, and so they wanted me to bring uh, two homies with me. So I always do this, I pick the same way. And I, sometimes I do it, sometimes I don't. Depending if it's, if it's one city, I can do it. If it's multiple trips, I don't do it. But, um, but I always invite enemies, rivals, so, so that they have to share a hotel room just to mess with them a little bit. So, <laughs> and my second criteria is I always invite people, homies who've never flown before just to, for the thrill to see them terrified in the sky. <laughs> so, but I've done this hundreds and hundreds of times with men and women, and, uh, and I've never, the one who wins the prize is this kid, Mario. Now, Mario was just so terrified of flying, he was just hyperventilating, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and we hadn't even gotten on the plane yet. So we're at Burbank Airport, and Mario's this big, tall, drink of water, skinny kid, and, and we're, we're sitting there. And, it, and it's kind of a small airport, if you've ever flown there, and it's big uh, bay windows, and, and Southwest principally flies there. And so it, you go out into the tarmac, there's no hermetically sealed chute, you know. And uh, so uh, our plane comes in, it's in the morning, and, and you, you know, you, when you get on the plane, you climb up the the steps to the front of the plane or the back of the plane, like you're the president of the United States. So, <laughs> so uh, I'm, Mario's there, and I, in the plane, our plane arrives, and I said, "There's our plane," and he, 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 and I go, "He may die before we actually get on it." And <laughs> so people get off the plane, and then our crew is ready to and board. And so uh, two female flight attendants with big large cups of Starbucks are schlepping up the front steps. And Mario goes, when are we going to board the plane? And I said, as soon as they sober up the pilots. Um, <laughs> there, there they go now. OK, I pro probably shouldn't have said that. So, uh, but I should tell you that Mario probably wins the prize of most tattooed guy ever to, in 26 years, to work at Homeboy. Unbelievable, his arms, he's all sleeved out, his whole neck is blackened with the name of his gang. His whole face, except for kind of a, a little circle here where you can see his eyes, nose, and mouth, but the rest is covered in tattoos. And so, I had never been in public with him, so I'm walking through the, the Burbank airport, I'm watching people go like this, you know, and, <laughs> and mothers are clutching their kids a little more closely, and, and I think, wow, isn't that interesting, because if you were to ask anybody at Homeboy, quick, name the kindest, most gentle, tender soul who works here, they wouldn't have to wait, and they go, Mario, who works in the merchandise store. He just, was just effusive in his gratitude, in his kindness, in his tenderness. He's just unbelievable, really. You know, like, uh, for as terrified as he was on the plane, a 
flight attendant would hand him peanuts, but he, he wouldn't just take them and he wouldn't just thank her. He, he'd grab her hand and look her in the eye and <laughs> thank you so much. It was just over the top. So, so we get to uh, Gonzaga, and this happens in some schools, and it didn't happen here, so I'm really grateful, thank you, but uh, it'll have the big talk like this, and then they don't tell you that they have nine other talks that they're going to have, you know, so class, class, meeting, class, 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 all day long, like nine of them. So I tell the homies, I say, look, I want you to give these classes. I'm going to sit in the back of the room, and I want you to tell your stories. Well, they were a little terrified, but they got up and they did it, and uh, amazing stories of abuse and torture and terror and abandonment, of violence and neglect, and honest to God, if their stories had been flames, you'd have to keep your distance, otherwise you'd get scorched. So when the nighttime came like this, and it was, you know, it was like a couple thousand people, and uh, I told him, I said, I want you to get up before me and do a little snapshot, five minutes or so, and tell your story so I could include you in the question and answer. And they were terrified, but they did it, and they did a good job. Okay, so then question and answer, and a woman over here, she stands, she goes, yeah, first question. Uh, I got a question, it's for Mario. First question out of the gate is for Mario. So he steps up to the microphone, yes. <laughs> and he's just terrified. And she goes, well, you said you're a father and, and you have a son and a daughter who are about to enter their teenage years. What wisdom do you impart to them? You know, what, what advice do you give them? Mario stands there and he closes his eyes for a really long time and he's like getting a hernia trying to come up with the right answer. And <laughs> until finally these two little words slip out, I just, as soon as he says those two words, he buckles and he closes his eyes again and he's trembling and he's crying. Oh, but he wants to get the sentence out. I, I just don't want my kids to turn out to be like me. And there's silence. And the woman who asked the question stands. And now it's her turn to cry. And she says, why wouldn't you want your kids to turn out to be like you? You are loving. You are kind. You are gentle. You are wise. I hope your kids turn out to be like you. And a couple thousand people stand, and they will not stop clapping. And all Mario can do is hold his face in his hand, so overwhelmed that this room full of strangers had chosen to return him to himself. And that is the only praise God has any interest in. And I think if we know that, it changes everything. How we see, how we love, the courage of our own tenderness. And knowing that propels us out to the margins where we stand against all odds, in our own way, bracing ourselves because people will accuse us of wasting our time. But the prophet Jeremiah writes, in this place of which you say it is a waste, there will be heard again the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voices of those who sing. The praise that matters is enabling those voices to be heard. Thank you very much.
No, I, was say I was saying to my colleagues sitting in the audience, oh, this is going to be a hard act to follow. <laughs> but it's truly an honor to have you with us this evening, Greg, to witness one heart inspiring many souls. So in celebration of your visit and your ministry, it's my delight as president to present to you Dominican University's most heartfelt recognition, the Golden Rose of Charity, awarded to an individual whose character and contributions exemplify faith-filled service. The citation reads, Father Gre Gregory Boyle, for your boundless compassion in the creation of a more just and humane world. Now, those of us who have read Tattoos on the Heart know that you will likely share this award with one of your homeboys or girls. So let me make you a deal. You give this award to a talented and deserving student and consider it my IOU. When that student is ready to attend college, have him or her give it back to me in exchange for a scholarship. Thank you again, and thank you, President Carroll. Truly an honor. I, we all, I think, today heard Father Greg invite us to all be one, but the true privilege is feeling one with you this evening, so thank you. I would like to, a few um, logistical announcements. We are selling books in the lobby, and Father Greg has graciously offered to stay until every book is signed. So, <laughs> ushers will, <laughs> We'll see how that promise goes. Ushers will help. Um, you'll be able to line up on the stage here to my left, and we'll pull a table out here. We also have cookies and juice in the lobby. And just a final note, we do offer several programs at the Siena Center. Our next event is October 14th, a play called Living Water. And the box office has remained open for those of you who might want to grab a ticket this evening. So again, thank you, Father Boyle. Thank you, President Carroll. And thank you all.